This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is uh, Timur, the Central Asian conqueror, also known as Tamerlane or Timur the Lame. And I have Timothy May, an expert on his life, and we'll be talking about it when we return. Timothy May is my guest. He's a professor at the University of North Georgia, and he's an expert on Central Asia, Islam, the Mongols. And today we will be talking about Tamerlane, a.k.a. Timur the Lame. Uh, so welcome, Timothy. Before we get into the man himself, if you could uh, spend a couple of minutes, give a little bit of background about who you are and your interest uh, in Central Asia generally and in Timur specifically. Hi, um, yeah, I'm Professor Timothy May. I'm the author of several books, including The Mongol Art of War, The Mongol Empire, The Mongols, um, and The Mongol Conquest in World History. Uh, my interest in Central Asia, the Mongol Empire, dates back to when I was in uh, fifth grade when I first read a book about Chinggis Khan. I first got into uh, Tamerlane uh, when I was in college and I wanted to work on an independent study on some aspect of Central Eurasian history. And uh, it started then and I continue to examine all facets of uh, offshoots of the Mongol Empire, including Timur's uh, empire. So, uh, what is, was he known as in his day? Was he known as Tamerlane, or as Timur the Lame, or as Timur, uh, just like you said, Chinggis rather than Genghis Khan? A lot of these uh, older fellas seem to be known by a different uh, different handles. What was uh, Timur's name then known as? He was usually referred to as the Emir Timur. Uh -huh. Um, and how his name is spelled depends on what language you're transliterating it from. Uh, he was Turkic or Turk Mongolian, uh, so it was more like Timur, which means uh, iron. Um, Tamerlane is the English corruption of Timur Iling, hmm. which is Persian for Timur the Lame. Um, no one close to him would have called him that. Um, he, he certainly was lame. He suffered uh, some arrow wounds from his youth when he was rustling livestock. Um, and that did indeed render him lame. Um, on one side of his body, uh, the Soviets uh, opened his tomb back in, what was it, 1941? Yeah. And they examined the body and everything. And, and it is verified that indeed he did have some uh, wounds that would have prevented him uh, from using his leg very well. He was uh, shot in the hip and also in the elbow. Um, so despite this, he was a, a guy who was a leader among men in an age where, you know, you really needed to be able to ride a horse and get around pretty well. Um, so, yeah, uh, no one would have called him Timur Iling unless they were not too fond of him. <laughs> and, uh, and suicidal, probably. A little bit suicidal, I would think. <laughs> uh, another title he went by was, uh, you know, something that I tried to adopt, uh, Sahib Kiran, which means Lord of the Favorable Planetary Conjunction. <laughs> the university won't let me put that on my business cards, though. Yeah. Um, so when you said that he was shot in one side, was he actually paralyzed on like, the left or the right side, or was it just in the one leg? It was on one side. If I remember correctly, it's the right. I'd have to look it up uh, to double check. But Now that also brings up, uh, when you talked about him opening the tomb, that brings up links to a couple of uh, sort of legendary things about him. And we'll get to the man himself, but I want to get this first. The first is uh, that in... in Mentioning Temujin or Genghis Khan, the founder of the Mongol Empire, uh, recently, within the last three, four, or five years or so, there were studies that showed that somewhat close to maybe 15 to 20 percent of people in Asia actually have genetic ties to Genghis Khan himself and his lineage. Since we have found Timur's uh, tomb, we still don't know where Genghis Khan's is, but but can we make any real genetic connection to him? Because a lot of the people from India, the, the Mughals, uh, people in the Middle East, people in the Far East, have claimed to have been descendant of Genghis Khan. 
Some of them probably just a lot of bullshit, but uh, was Timur actually uh, a genetic relative? Do we know this? Uh, if you go back far enough, certainly um, there's some evidence that, uh, you know, ba based on the sources, they do have a common ancestor, like they'd be dis very, very distant cousins, uh, but there's no direct connection to Timur to uh, Chinggis Khan. No. Timur was what would be known as a good again or a, a son-in-law of Chinggis Khan because he did marry a Chinggisid princess, mm -hmm. um, but he was not of Chinggis Khan's family directly. And what do we know about his actual ethnic origins? Because uh, there's some famous uh, paintings of him and also some busts of him that show him as clearly looking what we used to call mongoloid or Asiatic. Um, yeah. But the same thing has been said, for example, about Attila the Hun, and we don't know if that's so. Certainly uh, the, the, the Mongols themselves were mongoloid uh, looking. Uh, is the popular presentation or the pic pictures of him, is that just fanciful or is that basis in fact when the, the Soviets opened his tomb? Uh, the bust is definitely um, a real um, portrayal of him. It is based off of the skull they did, uh, the, the reconstruction uh -huh. based off of that. Uh, he would look Asiatic. Uh, he was Turkic. Uh -huh. um, it must be, first of all, remember that the Turks originated from Mongolia. Yeah. Um, when we think of Turks, we think of Turkey, but that's not quite the same. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, uh, Timur came from the Barlas tribe. That's after the tribe uh, became Turkicized over time in Central Asia, but originally the Barlas were known as the, the Barulas, and they were a Mongolian tribe. Mm. And they moved into Central Asia as part of the Mongol expansion. So he would have considered himself um, of the Mongols. Yeah. Yeah, some people, uh, I know I've recently done some shows on both Cyrus the Great and uh, uh, Alexander the Great, and people don't seem to realize that the Turks were relative latecomers to Asia Minor when yeah. you had the Lydians and other other tribes there. They were they were more looking like Persians or the Greeks in, in that whole Fertile Crescent region. But right. uh, but uh, uh, just to uh, again get back to some of the legendary stuff before we get on to the more factual stuff. I think it was three days after the opening of the tomb was when Hitler launched uh, Operation Barbarossa against yep. uh, the Soviet Union's. And was there actually uh, something planted within the tomb that said, he who shall disturb this shall unleash a tyrant greater than I, or something to that effect? According to legend, yes, there, there was uh, something like that, a, a curse or something. Um, it's, uh, I've never seen the tomb myself. I have not had the good fortune to go uh -huh. uh, to what is now Uzbekistan, uh, Samarkand, where his tomb is. Uh, so I haven't seen any legend of it. But um, according to legend, that's what it says. So when you say that, so when you say that uh, it's in Uzbekistan, is that now like a national shrine or monument, or is, is he looked at as a, a great man or a, a demon? Yeah, curi curiously, um, Timur is considered the national hero of Uzbekistan. Huh. Um, what's curious about that is that the Uzbeks actually drove out the Timurids from that region. Hmm. Um, Babur, uh, who founded the Mo Mughal Empire yeah. in India, was a descendant of uh, Tamerlane. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and the Uzbeks are the ones who drove him out. But yet now the Uzbeks um, have made him a, a national hero. You always uh, go with the winner, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> well, they, they have plenty of guys that they could have picked, but um, none of them are quite as you know, well-known as Tamerlane in the world view. And we'll get into the, his his religious beliefs in a bit, but one of the, the names that he was supposedly known as was the Sword of Islam. Uh, and people have long debated uh, the same way they do about whether Hitler was an opportunist or really hated the Jews. They've debated whether uh, Timur was actually a devout Muslim or did he just use it for his own purposes when, when needed. What is your take on, was was he someone to, who was a devout uh, uh, Muslim, or was he just a conqueror who would use whatever ever he needed at a particular time? 
an opportunity. Well, I would say, um, he was a devout Muslim. Um, he really supported uh, various Sufis, particularly the Naqshbandi order. Um, in fact, uh, he made tunes for various Sufis. Um, now, the great thing about this is that depending on where you're at in the Islamic world, you would view him not as a good Muslim. Yeah. In fact, when he fought uh, Bayezid uh, Ilderim, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire at the time, you have this exchange between the two basically saying, you're a bad Muslim, you're not a good Muslim. Um, and so, you know, it's one of those things of often it's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Timur viewed himself as a good Muslim. Um, you have various people in Central Asia who view him as a good Muslim. But in places like Syria and Egypt, where Sufism was not viewed as a positive thing, he was not a good Muslim. He was a, you know, a, a person who said he was Muslim, but he really wasn't a Muslim. Well, uh, um, the thing, and I'm no expert on Islam, but uh, isn't Sufism, isn't that the, the order or the sect where music is encouraged and dancing and, and whatnot? Aren't they the, the most peaceful of Muslims, so to speak? Well, that's... Uh, a bit complicated. There's no, there's no easy answer to that because there's a wide variety of Sufism. Uh -huh. um, Sufism is not a single sect. There are dozens, um, and in some, yeah, there's dancing, music is approved, um, and, and in regular Islam, in, in many forms, uh, music and dancing. Uh, and the, the, the problem for particularly Americans is that. We tend to view Islam as a, a single-dimensional, monolithic religion, um, usually based off of you know what you see in the news, which lately is very strict, fundamentalist, usually heavily influenced by um, the Hanbali um, interpretation of Islamic law, uh, but also um, what is known as Wahhabi yeah. uh, Islam, uh, which is... Uh, kind of a, a variant of the Hanbali interpretation and is most widely known in Saudi Arabia. But that's one form. It's, you know, kind of like, you know, asking about Protestant Christianity. Um, if you look at Southern Baptist and then you look at Episcopalians, you get a very different view of Christianity. Same thing with Islam and particularly with Sufism. There's a wide variety. The the form of Islam that one commonly finds in Central Asia is much different from what you find in Syria, in Saudi Arabia, in, say, uh, West Africa or Indonesia. They're all quite different. So, uh, Timothy, let us uh, get to the man himself since we've talked a little bit, bit about uh, the, the legends about him. Uh, you said that he's a, a distant relative of uh, the Khans. Uh, so where was he born? Uh, was he born into a relatively affluent family? Was he was he someone you know born to lead, or was he you know who who was he and where, what was his family life early on? Uh, Timur was born into well, sort of a privileged position. Uh, he was born near um, Samarkand in modern day Uzbekistan, uh, in a region that was then known as Mawaranahar. Um, the old Greek name, and sometimes still uses Transoxiana, uh, the area between the Sirdaria and Amudaria rivers. Um, his father was the leader of the Barlas tribe um, in that area, so he was a, a commander of some importance in the um, Chagatayid Ulus, um, the old Chagatay. Uh, Khanate, yeah. which was beginning to fracture. Um, so he, he was from an aristocratic family. Um, his life was uh, so somewhat privileged, but it was also a bit of a chaotic time. And it, what happened was that um, the Khanate was fracturing into more or less the eastern and western portions um, the western portion was more Islamic, um, 
focused around the great cities of Samarkand, Bukhara, and some others. Um, and then a non-Chinggisid commander, uh, Kazagan, um, uh, assassinated Kazan Khan, the ruler of, of Mawar Nahar, and then we get another invasion by the Chagatayans um, across the river in what became known as Mogulistan, um, and try to bring that back under control. And what we have at the time is an area that is, um, well, as I said, fractured. The Those who lived in Mawar Nahar basically viewed the nomads, the, the Mongols who lived in what was what they called Mogulistan, uh, the, the land of the, of the Mughals, or the Mongols. Mughal is a Persian form of Mongol. Um, they viewed them as uh, what they called uh, jets or jats, basically bandits. And they viewed themselves as the, as the true Chagatayids, whereas the, the Mughals viewed themselves as the true Chagatayids and, and viewed those living in Mawar Nahar as the uh, Karauna, or the, the black ones, the commoners. Um, so there's a lot of name calling back and forth of who's more Mongol um, or who's the rightful uh, rulers of the area. Uh, but Timur certainly did start off as a great power. Um, he was just one of several. Uh, when uh, the Chagatayids from Mogulistan came in and took over, he was able to be in a good position where he was appointed as the governor of Kish, or the you know basically their representative there. And then he was involved in some power struggles that eventually by 1370 he emerged as the victor in Mawar Nahar. Well, before we get into him, could you describe his rise about, let me just let's turn back a little bit to, to his youth because you had mentioned earlier about uh, how he was rustling uh, a horses, I believe, which got him injured. So was this basically a guy who was basically the equivalent of a modern rich kid just acting like a young asshole? Or was he a, was he a career criminal the way Stalin was before he took power? Um, I don't think you could call him a career uh, criminal, because basically what all these guys did um, was, you know, they, they would do some pillaging and plundering. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of their job description as a leader. And it was during one of these raids that he did get injured. But, you know, just as he rises in power in his youth, he also falls out of favor and um, he gets kicked out. Of power a couple times and you know he's competing with a relative he's competing with others um, it, it kind of gets a little muddled in the sources of um, you know when he's on top when he's he's not and exactly what his status is um, some would definitely call him a bandit some would say he's not a bandit um, so it, it, his youth is much like Chinggis Khan's becomes a little muddled and confused well, let's uh, let's talk about though his mindset uh, from early on. Now, you'd er earlier said that, said that he considered himself a good Muslim. Was he raised in the Muslim faith, and was he going to you know the equivalent of what what we call Sunday school? Was he constantly drilled in that, or did he also f feel himself as the lineage of the Mongols? Did he have that? Was there a was there any conflict in him between his religious Islam? and his nationalistic view of himself, presumably, as a descendant of the, the Khans. Well, again, he wasn't a, a descendant of the Khans, but he was descended from the Mongols. Yeah. Um, but, but, he, did, but, but he did propagate, he sort of latched on to Genghis Khan, so did he, was that just a useful tool for him later on? Yes, because what he did was, um, he never claimed to be the Khan. He huh. would he used the title of Emir, yeah. and then later Sahib Karan, the Lord of the Favorable Planetary Conjunction, which has some implications in Islam as um, kind of a, a guy destined to rule. Okay. But what he did was he always had a descendant of Chinggis Khan on the throne, mm -hmm. and that he was um, he was the guy who did his bidding. I mean, everyone knew that he was the the Khan, but that, or rather that Timur was the power behind the throne. Yes. Um, but he never claimed it because at that time to be a legitimate ruler, you needed to be descended from Chinggis Khan. Uh -huh. 
Um, so what Timur did was he married into the family. He became a, a son-in-law, even though you know Chinggis Khan's long dead. If you married a princess from the Chinggis family, that gave you some clout. So he was the puppet master then. Well, I'm sorry, what was that? He was sort of the puppet master of the of the people. Exactly. Okay. Um, and, and this was uh, fairly common. It was hard for people in the Mongol world to take you too serious unless you had a connection to Chinggis Khan. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you could try to forge a genealogy, but there are too many people who would know otherwise in the area that he was yeah. living. Now, let me to, just ask, ask a question, him. because I know that when I've read up on and uh, interviewed so, some other people about uh, uh, the founding of the Mongol Empire. One of the things that set it apart initially, at least during uh, Genghis's time, and uh, at least in the 13th century, was that it was well known that that they did not uh, they rewarded people, especially in the military, based upon merit, supposedly, rather than right. rather than just uh, relationships uh, to to uh, genetic relationships or blood relationships, as they would call it. It seems to me what you're saying, though, that because by this time the Chagatai uh, Khanate, I guess, had become uh, Islamized, that this was no longer so? It became more like other things, that it was blood was more important than competence? Um, yes and no. There's still opportunity for those uh, with ability to rise up. Mm -hmm. But what had happened between the lifetime of Chinggis Khan and the lifetime of Timur is that Chinggis Khan certainly awarded merit. However, he sometimes he's a little over too generous. Mm -hmm. And the privileges that he gave to someone would extend to their descendants as well. So he created a new aristocracy after getting rid of the aristocracy of the steppes. Mm -hmm. um, so his commanders became the new aristocracy, and this is what Timur was born into. Huh. However, um, there were still plenty of opportunities for people to rise in power and authority. Um, but yeah, who you're descended from, if you're descended from one of the great commanders, it gave you a leg up. Yeah. But it, there, it wasn't the only way of doing it. And also, often these commanders would rise and fall based off of their association with various uh, Chinggisid princes. So if the guy you were supporting failed, you would also go down in, in status. Huh. So... Uh, you had mentioned by 1370 or so he had consolidated his power, uh, but let's let's talk about that rise to power. Was this was Timur the kind of guy who was uh, gaining fame across the countryside? Was he well known by by the non elites, or, or was he someone that was was you know poisoning this guy, assassinating that guy, or, or was it a combination of uh, military victories and uh, strategic assassinations that uh, brought him? Um, it was more of his military victories. Um, he had a, a rival who was actually his brother-in-law, um, Hussein, uh, and they eventually had a falling out, and um, he had a struggle with an uncle over domination in the Barlis tribe. But he did gain a lot of support from um, non-elites as well. Mm -hmm. He tended to be pretty generous uh, mm -hmm. with his support. Um, again, you know, he, he has this wound from his earlier days, which puts him at a disadvantage because, again, we're talking about society that looks at um, physical ability as something that will that will be important. Um, but his uh, his leadership talents. Are what really gain support. He does figure out, you know, how to get people to buy into, shall we say, what he's selling. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's religious leaders, whether it's other military leaders, he he figures out who has talent, much like Chinggis Khan. But at the same time, he's also keen on making sure that um, the old elites aren't able to accumulate more power to become a challenge to him. Mm -hmm. He's very good at juggling. Loyalties. So, uh, was the, was there a rival state that uh, once he at least got back into or got into power as the puppet ma master, 
what what was the the geopolitical situation around him him and his power base? What what what? Because like when I was talking with someone about uh, about uh, Cyrus the Great, we were talking about the Medes and. Uh, uh, the d different uh, tribes of Persia and, and the powers around. What was there? Was there a USSR to our to his USA in the Cold War? Or? Yes, um, we do have several other states uh, that that are around him. Um, for one, immediately across the river, the Sir Darya, we still have uh, the Mughals or the uh, the Chagatayids, um, who are rivals. Um, we also have the the Jochid Bulus, or um, what's often called the, the Golden Horde, yeah. um, which has fractured a bit, but there are some movements of reunification there. Now, both the Chagatayids and the Jochids, the sons of Jochi, the, yeah. the son of Genghis Khan, they're all based off of a Khan who is a direct descendant of Genghis Khan. Yeah. Um, and then to the south, we have the former Mongol Ilkhanate, yeah. which ended in 1335, the year he was that uh, Timur was born. This has devolved into a number of statelets. We have the Ak Karahoylanlu, the Karahoylanlu, basically the white and black sheep uh, Turk uh, confederations. We have in northern India the Sultanate of Delhi. Uh, we have uh, the Ottoman Empire in uh, what is now Turkey or Anatolia. Uh, we also have the Mamluk Sultanate. So we have several powers, all kind of jockeying for position. Now, was this was this uh, when his rise of power? This was after the Battle of Ain Jaluk when the Mongols were repelled, right, uh, by by the Mamluks. Uh, that's in 1260. Uh, okay, when we yeah, get to yeah. 1370, we have all these states. Okay, but. Prior to this, a, a, immediately after Ain Jalut, we have the Mongol Ilkhanate dominating basically the Middle East, excluding Syria. Um, and then to the north, in the steppes of Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Russia, we have uh, the Jochid Ulus, or again, the, the Golden Horde, as it's become known as. In Central Asia, we have the Chag Chagatay Khanate, which uh, Timur's immediate domain was just a portion of it, or roughly half of it. And had had uh, the Yuan Dynasty of, uh, of what's his name, uh, uh, Kublai Khan, had that already faded? Had the, the Chinese taken it back by that time? In 1368, that's when the Yuan um, lose China. They still exist in Mongolia. Yeah, they'll continue to exist um, in various forms up into about 1388. Um, when they become known more as the Northern Yuan Dynasty. So has does. Uh, Timur at any point emerged from behind the throne and in, in, we have you would mention he's the puppet master but is there ever a time when it's like you know fuck it I'm the guy in charge you know that that he, he really takes the reins and does he have that sort of let's call it a vision that uh, Temujin or Kublai Khan had of uh, of the world or is he just another you know Central Asian conqueror well actually he will um used the Mongol legacy as part of what he tries to do and establish his empire. Basically, he claims he's restoring the Mongol empire. Uh -huh. He is acting on behalf of the Khans. Yeah. Uh, most specifically, the Ilkhanates. Um, because in 1335, as I said, that ends, it breaks apart into several warring states, all usually led by some former general... Uh, or some uh, aristocratic family of the Ilkhanate, mm -hmm. um, like the, the Chobanids, the Jalayirs, um, who will dominate uh, the Baghdad area, Iraq. Um, so he'll use that. And Timur will always have these um, Chinggisid Khans on the throne as you know his representative, basically, mm -hmm. um, to give him legitimacy as a Chinggisid um, you know, so that he can claim that he's doing this on behalf of them. Um, he, every, everyone knows that he's the guy in charge, uh -huh. but he still goes through with this um, because it shows respect to the Chinggisid family. It gives him a little bit more clout, more association, um, association with the Chinggisid family. And he'll go through three Chinggisid cons. 
Um, they all die of natural causes. They never try to assert authority over him. Um, they accompany him on campaign. Uh, but his, his successors won't go through this because he's developed enough charisma that they can rule as a descendant of Timor. So uh, before we talk about some of the more, uh, the more noteworthy campaigns and some of his tactics, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, where he would have been. Uh, we, I, I mentioned uh, uh, whether he or not he had a vision. Uh, one of the images that stands out the most about uh, Timur or Tamerlane in the Western mind is the idea of skulls piled up, you know, as high as a, a, a mountain. Um, uh, and b depending on who you read, He's responsible for anywhere from 15 to maybe 20 million deaths, supposedly. Um, so was he someone that uh, when he was fighting, uh, did he follow the old uh, Temujin way of, you know, if you surrender, we won't kill you. Or if you don't surrender, we're wiping you from the face of the earth. What was his strategy, not necessarily militarily, but politically uh, against when he uh, besieged a city? Well, he would go through the whole, you know, surrender or die kind of um, diplomacy. Uh, but he definitely preferred ruling through fear. Um, he, his conquests are a bit different from, from the Mongols. Um, the Mongols definitely had developed the idea over time, not in the lifetime of Chinggis Khan, but um, after Chinggis Khan, they definitely believed that heaven had bequeathed the earth to um, the heirs of Chinggis Khan. And if you did not submit, then you were in violation against the will of heaven, you were rebelling against heaven's will, and therefore you should be destroyed. Um, by Timur's time, that idea was still kind of out there, but the fact was that there were other Chinggisids out there, so he could not claim that exclusively. Um, and again, why he needed a Chinggisid on the throne was to give legitimacy in the face of these other Chinggisids, mm -hmm. um, like uh, Tolkemish in the uh, in um, the Golden Horde. Um, but what he would do when he's conquering is he would conquer, um, he would massacre, and we do get these pyramids of skulls. Although he's certainly not the first to do it. Yeah. Um, actually, the uh, Kartid dynasty. Um, that ruled Herat, the city of Herat in modern-day Afghanistan, uh, not too far away, um, did it before him. And Timur certainly would employ these tactics to instill fear. And unlike the Mongols who try to create an empire and then rule it directly, Timur would conquer, he would take the tribute, but it doesn't seem that he was too concerned about the stability of many areas. He wanted a very stable uh, Mawarnahar, or, you know, around Samarkand, his home territory. He wanted that very stable. But it doesn't seem like he was particularly concerned if someone rebelled, because he knew he could just come back, put down the rebellion, pillage again, and take stuff back to Samarkand. Um, that sounds a lot like uh, Attila, almost, that uh, he's just like, well, I don't give a damn, damn about conquering territory. Just pay me my tribute and show me the money. So it was yeah. He's, he's much more focused about keeping his home turf great and secure. He does rule the other areas. Uh -huh. uh, he assigns territories to his sons and his grandsons, but he's not trying to set up as much of a centralized government as the Mongols did over time. Um, and this is not too unexpected because he's constantly on the move. So he may not have just ever really gone around to it. Mm. It seems to me when I've seen maps of the Timurid uh, expansion that he basically uh, conquered much of the same territory outside of his home base as had Sargon, as had Cyrus, as had Alexander the Great. It, it's pretty much the, the same uh, rich area. Um, was Do you know if, uh, what were they educated in those? Because there's a, 
because you go from Sargon, who's like uh, 2300 BC to 700 BC with Cyrus, to, to or 500 BC with Cyrus, to like 300 BC with Alexander. Was he aware of these former conquests? Did he have a sense outside of the Mongol lineage that 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 he he wanted to be seen the way Cyrus or Alexander was? Well, I think he wanted to be more seen like uh, Chinggis Khan. Yeah. Um, than any of those. He would have been aware of Cyrus, um, Darius. He would have been aware of them uh, through the Shah Nama, which the, the Book of Kings, um, which was a very popular work of literature uh, in not only Iran, but also Central Asia, uh, basically the, the Persianate world. Um, Alexander the Great lived long in legend in the Islamic world um, and actually uh beyond the Islamic world and the Christian world. Alexander was a, a great hero. Um, and somehow he becomes a Christian hero as well, despite being well before Christianity. Um, he's an Islamic uh, hero before Islam um, comes onto the scene. So he, he's aware of all this, but really, the, if he's going to emulate somebody, it's going to be Chinggis Khan. And indeed, what he claims is, you know, it, it looks like he's following more or less the path of Alexander the Great and Cyrus, mm -hmm. but really he's retaking, he's reconquering the Ilkhanate, the Mongol Ilkhanate. Yeah. Um, he does venture across into Mogulistan, but basically that is to um, deal with those guys when they bother him. Mm -hmm. Um, he asserts his, his domination and basically shows them I'm the major power, but he's not trying to rule it directly just because he knows that as Chinggisids, they're never going to fully accept him. Yeah. Well, what was with the Golden Horde? Yeah, so, because uh, I know that the Golden Horde at that time was in a lot of ways concerned with the Rus that eventually became Russia. Um, and you had earlier said that uh, at some level, I guess, he was looking to reestablish the Mongol Empire. Um, did he, uh, I mean, because like, like you said, he re basically took over the same lands that Alexander and Cyrus and Sargon had uh, uh, centuries before. But did he ever, ha it doesn't seem that he went north. He didn't go, he didn't, he didn't head towards uh, the Ukraine, really, or, or the, the Rus, or the Kievan Rus, I guess what it would have been called then. Uh, he, de he doesn't seem to have ventured back towards Mongolia or China, or am I wrong? You are mistaken on that. Okay. Yeah. Because he did Before go into those areas. He did, okay. Yeah, what he did actually was, um, because we have a, a rising power in um, the, the territories of the Golden Horde, um, that are east of the Volga River, uh -huh. uh, which was known as the the Blue Horde. Um, yeah. This was ruled by an uh, individual named Urus Khan. Um, he was a, a descendant of Genghis Khan. Um, and there's, there's some other guys. So there's some pressure on his borders uh, from Urus Khan. So what Timur does is he supports a protege named Toktamish. Toktamish is another great, 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 great grandson of Chinggis Khan and a rival of Urus Khan. And eventually, through Timur's support, Toktamish is able to become the ruler of the, the Blue Khanate, or the, the Blue Horde, shall we say. Um, and this is the... The blue part is the eastern portion of the Jocha domains, um, and then the the western portion, west of the Volga River, is the the White Horde and what becomes eventually known as the Gold Horde. Gold Horde is a term that appears in the 16th century in the Russian sources. The Mongols never really called it that, um, but this western portion had basically gone through a, a, a situation sort of similar to what Timur did in Central Asia. Uh, there is a Mongol general named Mame. Um, at first, he rules through some puppet khans. Um, he is a rising power, and um, because he's not a Chinggisid, the Rus kind of see this as a moment of weakness. The, the Russians, Moscow stops paying tribute. Um, Mame goes up to fight them, uh, he loses, and so Moscow has become independent since the throwing off the Mongol 
yoke in 1380 at, at um, the Battle of Kulikovo. And, um, yeah, at, at the Battle of Kulikovo. And uh, Mamme is defeated, and uh, he kind of is losing support. This is when Totamish sees an opportunity to, to reunify the Golden Horde. So he moves west, and he defeats uh, Mamme. Um, and then he immediately goes to Moscow and sacks it. Um, the, the ruler of um, Moscow flees. And so now the Golden Horde is reunified. It's a powerful state. Mm -hmm. And now that he's powerful again, he's not so concerned about Timor anymore as you know his sponsor, as his patron. And this becomes a problem for Timor. Mm -hmm. Because when Timor is out west... Um, he's moving into Azerbaijan, which is territory that has long been claimed by the Golden Horde. In fact, the Golden Horde and the Ilkhanate fought a series of wars over Azerbaijan. Yeah. Because it was where the, the Ilkhanate made its capital, but the, 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 the Jochids always claimed this territory. And they never got it until the collapse of the Ilkhanate, but then they lost it promptly because we have uh, the outbreak of the, the Black Plague in the Jocha territories, and then just everything goes to hell in a handbasket. So this incursion by uh, Tokhtamish into Azerbaijan, and then also on the borders of Timur's territory in Mawarnhar, starts a war between those two. Mm. And eventually Timur is going to invade um, the steppes. He defeats uh, Tokhtamish there, uh, the, but Tokhtamish never loses power. There's another war where eventually Timur gets tired of it, and he invades um, across the Caucasus. He goes to Sarai, the capital of the Golden War. He burns that. Um, he'll move around, destroying various cities. Um, the, the Russians have a great legend that he's marching on Moscow, and the Virgin Mary appears before Timur, and he, he turns away in, in terror. Um, that, of course, doesn't happen. Um, but, you know, it's what's actually happening is that Timor is destroying the cities of the Golden Horde. Uh -huh. And what he's doing, actually, is rerouting the Silk Road. He's driving, by destroying these trading cities, these commercial cities, he's rerouting the Silk Road completely through his own territory, mm -hmm. leading, of course, to Samarkand the jewel of the empire. Yeah. And what he does is he carries back a lot of loot from all these cities, a lot of stuff, and he names the suburbs after the cities he's conquered. Hmm. Um, but yeah, he invaded that area, and, and then he puts his own um, protégés on the throne of the Gold Horde and, and you know, backs a non uh, Chinggisid to make sure that Tokhtamish never comes back to power. Tokhtamish will kind of rise and fall and always be struggling for the throne. But um, Does he ever eventually get rid of him, or does Tokhtamish just die off? Tokhtamish will die off. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head roughly when he dies. I, it was around like 1405, near 1405. That's when Timur dies. Yeah. Uh, but... Tokhtamish actually tried to get back into Timur's good graces uh -huh. uh, at one point. And it looked like they were going to because um, there's some hints that um, the guy that Timur left in charge, Idigu, was beginning to get a little bit too comfortable with his power. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, and, and Timur does get involved in affairs in China. Um, he dies actually in 1405, preparing to invade China. Seriously? Hmm. Yeah, he he had his army assembled. Um, 1405. He's uh, let's see, he's 70 years old, yeah. and getting ready to invade China um, to deal with the Ming Dynasty. So, the, the, but he dies off, and that does the empire collapse quickly then. Yeah, basically it collapses as his sons and grandsons begin to struggle for, for domination. Mm -hmm. He appointed a successor, um, but that didn't really work out. Um, not everyone accepted that, 
and it's a mad scramble by his sons, and the empire gets divided into uh, about, once it settles down into about three or four timid states. So let me just, uh, at the height of his power, he has basically the Fertile Crescent, Persia, uh, I guess close to the Indus River, up to Transoxiana. Uh, are the blue are the blue horde states that he had conquered, are they satellites, vassal states, or are they formerly ever a part of his... his uh, they're, they're clients. Uh, what's interesting, and it shows how conscious he is of his non chinggisid heritage, uh -huh. in areas where there were Chinggisid princes, other than his puppet guys uh -huh. in um, Transoxiana, he does not try to incorporate them directly into his empire. He's very aware that he's not a Chinggisid, that the territories of the Golden Horde are never going to fully accept him. The territories of Mogulistan are never going to fully accept him. Um, so, so is this just political smarts by him to not do that? Or what did he have maybe an inferiority complex for not being a Chinggisid? I don't think he had an inferiority complex. No. I think it's political smarts on his part. He, no. he realizes it's better to to find a Chinggisid who will be cooperative with him. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, if he can make things unsettled there, that they're too busy dealing with their own issues, they won't bother him. Okay. Uh, so uh, by the time of his death, you say uh, he was planning on going into, uh, into China to take on the Mings. It's similar to like when I did the Alexander, speaking of Alexander the Great, that he had plans actually to move westward uh, against the Carthaginians and uh, the Romans, actually, but uh, nothing ever happened of that because of his death. Uh, did he ever plan any invasions of India? Because that would have been, I think, easier than China. He did invade India. Okay. And um, he defeated the Sultanate of Delhi, uh, basically destroyed it. It he did not occupy it. He pillaged, he plundered, he took a lot of loot home. Uh -huh. um, but it, he had no interest in ruling northern India. Um, the Mongols in general never uh, did well in India, uh, partially because of the humidity. Um, it affects their bows. But also, India is not a good place to raise horses. Uh -huh. um, the Horses don't do well over the long term, so throughout history, thousands and thousands of horses are brought from Central Asia into India to, to supply cavalry. Um, not only with you know the Sultan of Delhi, but every empire before that, and the British would also bring in thousands of horses from Central Asia for their own armies. And how about uh, the Levant and Asia Minor? Did he ever fully subdue those areas? Um, he did invade Syria. He defeated the Mamluk Sultanate. Uh, he laid siege to Damascus, took it. He actually um, was there when Ibn Khaldun, the great Muslim scholar, was there. And uh, they had conversations. Um, and, and Ibn Khaldun walked away very impressed with him. Um, in Anatolia, he fought uh, and defeated the Ottoman Empire. He probably actually saved Constantinople uh, by defeating Bayezid. He took Bayezid captive and actually transported him across back to Samarkand in a cage. This led to a legend of um, putting the, the sultan in a golden cage. Um, and it, it becomes a scene in Christopher Marlowe's play, Tamburlaine. But uh, Tamburlaine is, is not historically accurate uh, in any way. Other than Timur defeating Bayezid. Yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of ironic that the quote-unquote sword of Islam ends up saving Constantinople, which it then was the center of the Christian world. Right. Well, sort of a center. It, it, Constantinople was a far cry from what it used to be. Um, yeah. It loomed larger in legend. Um, by the time it fell in 1453, the population was probably around 50,000 as opposed to it at its height um, of 500,000. So, so but it, it still carried great significance. But, um, yeah, it, it's curious. He did not seem interested in, Timor, that is, did not seem interested in absorbing the Ottoman Empire into the state. He was fine, basically, uh, defeating Bayezid, 
uh, soundly crushing the Ottoman army and more or less letting the sons of Bayezid squabble over empire. Hmm. Um, and, and so it, it would take them about uh, a good decade or two to sort things out. Uh, so um, before we get in, uh, uh, and speak of his death in the aftermath, uh, do you think that he, he basically achieved what he wanted to achieve in his lifetime? Uh, or was he some, someone that ultimately, I mean, obviously he didn't reconstruct the Mongol Empire, so in that sense you could say that he failed. But uh, realistically speaking, the, the, the times had changed. They had complexed a bit more with the, the growing power of Islam in that area. Um, what, what was your sense of his sense of himself uh, by the time he was through? I think overall he would have been very satisfied with what he did. I mean, obviously he still had some other ambitions because he was about to go on campaign when he died. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he was 70 years old. Uh, living that long with the kind of lifestyle he had, um, that was tremendous in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he had conquered a lot of territory and the places that he did not absorb into his empire, he had rendered them um, to basically a non-threatening status. Uh -huh. The Sultan of Delhi was not a threat to him. The Mamluks were not a threat to him. Uh, the Ottomans were no longer a threat. Mm -hmm. um, and the, neither was the, the Jochen states or the Golden Horde. Um, and he had basically demonstrated that he was the most powerful empire in the region. Uh, we'll take a break and uh, just talk about his death in the aftermath. But before that, as a as a Mongol, did he ever uh, travel down to Mecca? By the way, uh, no. He, as a Muslim, he never went to Mecca. Did he ever go to any of the quote unquote holy cities? Then, um, I don't recall any mention of him going to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He never went to Mecca or Medina. He did go to various shrines in Central Asia, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. The various figures, and, and in Iran. So, how did he die? Um, and speaking of some other uh, famous leaders, you know, there's always uh, tales, legendary tales, you know, uh, Genghis Khan, we don't know where his tomb was, uh, Cyrus's tomb was was uh, sacked when Alexander came, well, it wasn't sacked, but was uh, destroyed, or vandalized, and Alexander famously... Uh, hunted down the desecrators of, uh, uh, are there any legends as to, as to, uh, uh how, uh, uh, Timur died? Uh, you know, uh, Cyrus suppose there's half a dozen legends of how he died. How did he die? And do we know specifically if that's correct or is it just legend? Um, we know from the sources that he died in Otrar, a, uh, border city, um, which also has, uh, the history or the, the, uh, shall we say, the good fortune of being a, a key city in the Mongol Empire. Uh, it's where a massacre happened that triggered the Mongol invasion of Central Asia. Uh, Timur dies in that city preparing to invade the Ming Empire. He's assembling his forces there. He's about to set off. Um, I believe it was February 1405. Mm. Um, so, you know, towards the end of winter that he's beginning to assemble his forces. And he dies, remember, he's about 70 years old at this point, and um, he just became sick mm. and died. There's no, no accusations causes. of poison or anything like that. Um, he was surrounded by his generals, his supporters, his family. Um, so let's talk about uh, some of his descendants then uh, and his family. So one would assume he had many wives, probably had many offspring. Uh, it, it, are there a lot of, uh, I mentioned the 15 to 20% figure about uh, uh, Genghis Khan's uh, descendants. Uh, it, does he have any kind of similar impact? I mean, was he basically screwing around <laughs> as he conquered all these areas? Are, are, do we know that there are Timurids still out there? There, there probably are because it was a large family. He had numerous sons, numerous grandsons. And then, of course, um, the... You know, the, the Timurid dynasty continues up until 1858 with the uh, Mughal Empire in India. Mm. Um, that was founded by Babur. Babur was a great-grandson 
um, of uh, Timor, or great great grandson of Timor. Was that Baba the Great, or no? Who was Akbar? Yeah, that was Baba the Great. Oh, yeah. Uh, but was Akbar the Great? Was he in any relation? Or is that back to yeah. the Mongol? Yeah, Akbar is a descendant of Timor as well. All okay. of the Mughal dynasty was uh, spawned from Timor. Oh, okay. Uh, they just relocated hmm. to, to northern India. So let's uh, let's talk then about his impact first militarily. Uh, uh, when people speak about uh, the great military leaders, you hear the same names. You, you hear Alexander, you hear Hannibal, and then later, much later on, you hear people like Napoleon. Subutai uh, uh, was the right hand man of Genghis Khan. Uh, militarily, how is Tamerlane viewed? Is he viewed? you know, in the top 10 or 20 generals? Is he given high marks? And is there any specific strategy that he was famed for? Um, yeah, he, Timur was viewed as a brilliant general. Indeed, he defeated all the major players of his day. Um, you know, Toktamish was probably, would have gone down as, in history as one of the greatest uh, Mongol leaders, if not for Timur. Um, Bayezid Ilderim. Uh, Ilderim um, means thunderbolt. So Bayezid the thunderbolt, the terror of Europe. Um, he probably would have taken Constantinople, but then Timur shows up in Anatolia. He has to go deal with it. Bayezid was the one of the most feared Ottoman sultans. Mm -hmm. He he'd crushed the uh, crusade at um, Varna. Um, he terrorized Hungary. All of Europe was quaking in their boots at Bayezid's approach. Mm -hmm. And then Timur defeats him, mm -hmm. almost casually. Um, Timur, without doubt, was the greatest military mind of the late 14th century. Um, so he would definitely be in the top 10 generals of all time. And then when uh, his perceptions, especially in the West, seems to have been... Uh, Oddly kind of favorable, I guess, because he defeated Bayezid. Um, yes. Marlowe writes, you said, Tambalane, the play. Uh, it seems to me that uh, much in the same way that <clears throat> that the Genghis Khan was somehow conflated with the mythic Prester John as this, this savior of Christianity from wherever, that uh, Tambalane, in a sense, uh, it becomes sort of an accidental hero to the Christian Europe's, Europeans. Yeah, and also a lot of this has to do with um, some people who wrote about him from the time period. Mm -hmm. One was um, uh, a emissary from the kingdom of Aragon, mm -hmm. uh, Clavio. Uh, he travels across um, the Mediterranean. He arrives in the Middle East, and then he travels back with uh, Timor and is present in his court. He meets Timur. Timur flatters him, um, says nice things about the king of Aragon, who he probably doesn't have no idea who he is. Um, what I love about Clavio's account is that either Clavio is incredibly naive or he's writing his report to make the king of Aragon think that, you know, oh, yeah, sure, Tamerlane's heard about you. He thinks you're really powerful and everything, but, you know, Aragon in the 1400 was nothing yeah. compared to what Timor is. Yeah. Um, but what's great about it is that you, you read this and you see Clavio at um, the court in Samarkand and Timor puts Clavio at a better seat than the ambassadors of the Ming Empire. Hmm. So you know he's using Clavio as a pawn to basically... Uh, show his disdain for the Ming uh, dynasty that you know he's planning on attacking. So you have this. You also have the account of a German named Schildberger, um, who probably does lie a lot about some of his adventures. But he was um, a young boy um, who was captured by Bayezid at the Battle of Varna, um, and then. Um, he is in the Ottoman army as a janissary and gets captured by Timur. And then he's brought back to the court. So we do have two European sources that, you know, paint this 
picture of, of the grandeur of Timor and the power of Timor, and they come across fairly positive. Um, as opposed to, you know, the Arabic sources that view Timor as rather negative because, well, they, they don't view him as a, as a proper Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, they accuse him of ignoring the Sharia and using the Yasef Chinggis Khan, which he did. Um, he used both because in Central Asia, you couldn't really separate those two. And, and because uh, Timor um, adhered to a Sufi form of Islam, Sufism tends to be more syncretic. Um, bringing in more local customs, and which is, of course, is how uh, people convert, is because you don't have to abandon your whole way of life to join something that otherwise might be completely alien. Um, all religions spread through that. Now, you, so we've, we've discussed uh, Tamerlane's uh, viewpoint for in Europe. You mentioned how it's hit or miss in the Islamic world. Uh, in the subcontinent and in China, I would assume in China he's not well regarded. Uh, in the subcontinent, since, since the Mughals did rule, is he favored more? Uh, is he more favorably seen there? Um, in modern India, I could not say, but historically, yeah, it, he would have been viewed quite favorably, um, just because of the Mughal Empire was the Timurids. They viewed themselves as Timurids. Um, and so they would have held him in high regard. Uh, and I've got two final questions. First is uh, uh, the original Mongol Empire, uh, Genghis Khan and later Kublai Khan, the two thorns in their sides that they never were able to really subjugate were uh, Genghis with Japan, two failures, you know, the, the kamikaze. And then uh, Kublai Khan uh, failed twice trying to invade Indochina. Um, uh, was there ever a particular area that that Timur wanted, but just it, he couldn't? It, either they were just so fierce, and, and they, were, they were so high up in the mountains that he couldn't get his hands on them. Was there? Well, I, I have to go back and correct you. Uh, Chinggis Khan never tried to invade Japan. That was Kublai Khan. Kublai oh, was Kublai Khan tried okay. to invade Japan and Indochina? Um, his success rate in Indochina is a little bit mixed because while militarily he could not. Uh, conquer it, yeah. and indeed the Vietnamese would basically use the tactics that were used then to deal with the, the Japanese, the French, and the Americans. Yeah. Um, he did get tribute from them, so they recognize it. So the, the Mongols would write that one off as a, as a victory, yeah. uh, while the Vietnamese will say, we, re, we repulsed them. So, yeah. you know, again, all perspectives. Yeah. But um, for Timor, no, there's not really anyone that he did not defeat that he set out to defeat. Again, I don't think he ever tried to truly conquer and rule the, the Golden Horde. Um, in northern India, he, he came, he saw, he pillaged, he, he plundered, and then took it all back. Um, he, he did not seem to have any interest in setting up shop there. Um, I'd say that his one regret was probably on his deathbed when he's about to go invade China. Uh -huh. um, Everywhere else, you know, if he wanted to bring it into his empire, he did. Everywhere else that he did not, it, it, it's not because he didn't win militarily. Yeah. Uh, before I ask my last question, though, just off the top of your head, do you think he could have succeeded in China? I kind of doubt it. Yeah. Um, I think he would have gone. I think he probably would have had a lot of military success, but I don't know if he would have truly tried to conquer all of it. Yeah. I think he would have gone and maybe if he, he, if he was able to get the support of the Mongols themselves in Mongolia, um, probably conquer northern China, but I don't see him trying to make the sustained effort to conquer all of China. And now here in the 21st century, what would you say are the misconceptions that we have of uh, Timur um, uh, in, in, any, in any regard, really? Well, I don't know how many misconceptions are. He was a very violent, very destructive individual. I think we just need to recognize that you know, he, he's a man of his era in many ways. And with any historical figure, you need to judge them 
on the values of that day to say you know they're they're a horrible person based off the 21st value 21st century values or 20th century values is just an exercise in futility you're ignoring what shaped them uh, the era they lived in um, he was definitely you know it's not a trendy thing but he was definitely a great man he was the central personality of the late 14th century for much of Eurasia, yeah. um, the most powerful figure, one of the most dominating. Um, and what does get lost is he sets in motion a lot of things. He was destructive. Um, his greatest achievements were certainly military achievements. Uh, his successors will be known for a, a Renaissance era in art, in science, and so forth. But Without Timor, none of that would have happened. Yeah. Do you think that he's he would be is, is he held in the same regard as people like I mentioned, like Cyrus and Alexander and Temujin? Is he held in that in that level? Because in the twentieth century, when we look back at the Stalins and the Hitlers, we you know, we have less than a century really to go from them. We don't know really how they'll be looked at in five hundred years. But what we have now about seven hundred plus years since uh, his death. Uh, is he is he one of the great men of history, or is he great just in that time? Do you think? I think he is one of the great men of history. Yeah. Um, I don't think he's currently viewed as such. Uh -huh. I don't think uh, Timur or his dynasty gets enough attention. To be quite honest, why do you uh, think that is? Do, do you think that people look at him as a third-rate Mongol or something? Often, yeah, they they view him as you know he he's a Chinggis Khan wannabe. Yeah. Um, in some ways that's true, in some ways it isn't. Uh -huh. he, he definitely deserves more attention. Uh -huh. um, and I hope that one day um, he'll get it. I, I, I have to admit, I don't give him enough attention in my own work and um, my own uh, scholarship just because there's so much to be done just on the Mongol Empire alone. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are groups of dedicated Timurid scholars, but um, they tend to focus more on uh, the later periods, I think, uh, basically post-Timor. Um, but hopefully more people will. That's well, the great thing is that there's always more to do. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you for spending your time speaking with me. I'll link to your UNG page underneath this video. People can check it out and uh, look up stuff that you've written and contact you if they want to. So thank you for speaking about Timur. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun.